Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to um, the Pandemic Pangolins Systems, Science and Society webinar. Um, today's webinar is um, entitled Ethics in a Time of Pandemic. And this is the fourth webinar in which we really delve into um, the progress and the issues that are relevant um, for the South African um, specific pandemic or epidemic rather, um, but also looking at global issues um, around uh, the pandemic um, in, in, in our societies and the issues that challenge us constantly. So in, in today's um, webinar, what um, the focus will be will really be a retrospective an analysis and discussion at um, how the um, pandemic has been handled and pertinent ethical issues specifically that pertain to um, clinical decision making in South Africa. Um, and this clinical decision making um, discussion will extend to both the public and private sectors of the healthcare system. And in addition to this, um, the webinar will also look into issues around um, stigma um, and health advocacy and the roles that they've played um, in, in, in the epidemic in, in South Africa. And so what we'll do now is basically introduce the speakers. Um, we have two presenters who will really take us through these pertinent ethical issues and we will get to understand um, some of the values and decision making um, frameworks that have been applied as well as the challenges thereof um, in, in the clinical setting settings of South Africa. Our first speaker is um, an associate professor, um, Kevin Behrens and director of the Steve Beaker Center for Bioethics. Um, and just a brief bio of um, Kevin Behrens, um, he, his research interests lie in, in the area of bioethics and environmental ethics, um, with a major emphasis in, in his work applying in African moral um, philosophical notions to ethical questions. Um, he is published very widely in international and local journals um, and holds an NRF rating as an established researcher um, level C1. He serves on research ethics committees of the CS. IR and is a consultant um, on the COVID-19 Clinical Ethics Committee of the Linmed Hospital Group. Our second um, presenter uh, for the webinar today is Professor Laurel um, Baldwin Ragavan. Um, professor Laurel Baldwin Ragavan is a professor in the School of um, Clinical Medicine under Family Medicine, um, and she is a physician, educator, scholar, and human rights advocate. Laurel is um, um, a clinical head of the family medicine um, for Southern African, S Southern Gauteng Health Districts, um, a, a combined service training platform um, providing comprehensive primary health care to a population over 9 million um, people. Um, she's a fellow of the Canadian College of Family Physicians um, and the South African College of Family Physicians. She holds a bachelor degree bachelor's degree in the, so, in the social science um, from Smith College, USA, and completed her medical training at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. With that, um, let us go straight into the presentations. We will receive our first presentation from Professor Kevin Burns. Thanks, Lizeka, um, and thank you also to the Department of Family Medicine and their team for the invitation. Uh, this afternoon, I'm just going to try to share my screen. So the focus uh, of my talk is going to be very narrow. I'm going to be looking specifically at clinical ethical issues um, in a time of pandemic. Uh, obviously, there are many other kinds of ethical issues, um, and I'm going to be focusing even more narrowly, very specifically on issues around triage of patients um, and dealing with a context of, of extreme limitation on resources. Um, primarily, the talk is based on personal reflections um, that arise from my involvement with uh, the pandemic through being involved with the Clinical Ethics Committee for one of the hospital groups, private hospital groups, um, as well as a paper which I wrote uh, quite early on uh, during the crisis, 
and was published in the Brits Journal of Clinical Medicine. Um, just do need to say that the views that I express are pretty much based on fairly limited data, as we know applies generally across uh, the board with this issue. Um, and largely the reflection of my personal experience. Um, also just want to say I'm going to sometimes talk about what I will refer to as a broadly held or dominant view um, in the bioethics literature. Uh, I'm not trying to suggest that consensus exists. Every single claim that I will make uh, is contested. Um, and there are, there's a lot of debate about these claims, uh, but there are at least some areas in which there's, there's a broad agreement, um, and I will refer to that from time to time. I think the most important thing to, to bear in mind is that, is that one of the things that happens when we move into a context such as this is that we move into a situation in which it's simply not business as usual anymore. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is a public health emergency, and as such, it's extraordinary situation and extraordinary situations require extraordinary responses. Um, and we can see how this has been reflected in the way in which there have been globally uh, travel bans, there have been lockdowns, other restrictions on people's liberties. Um, and there's also been an extraordinary diversion of resources to, to the pandemic response. As we all know in South Africa, um, we've dealt with this as a country by declaring a state of disaster, uh, which has allowed for, for different uh, rules and laws to, to apply um, in response to this context. In one of the earliest papers that was published about the pandemic, um, the Hastings Center in the US uh, suggested that when you find yourself in a public health emergency situation, there needs to be a shift from the standard ethical norms that we would normally apply in clinical practice uh, to a more public health ethics approach. Uh, so the standard approach is patient-centered. We focus on the individual needs and requirements of, of patients. Uh, but when we move into a situation like a disaster, uh, we have to then change the focus and focus more on the health of the population um, and by ensuring the best means, a uh, use of the means and resources available to us. Now, possibly the biggest challenge from a clinical perspective um, in the context that we're in um, is the expectation that we had from the start uh, that eventually we would reach a point in which demand for treatment would far exceed available resources. Um, again, Hastings Center spoke about how public health emergencies can feature what they called tragically limited resources that are insufficient to save lives that under normal conditions could be saved. Um, and that certainly was the, the image we all had in our minds as to what we might be expecting um, in, in the months that laid ahead. Um, and so we were definitely expecting that decisions would have to be made about resource allocation, about who to treat and who not to treat. Um, again, the Hastings Center said, in a public health emergency that features severe respiratory illness, which of course COVID-19 is, triage decisions may have to be made about the level of care, the initiation of life-sustaining treatment, the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment and referral to palliative care if life-sustaining treatment will not be initiated or is withdrawn. So the general consensus is that going into situations like that, up front there should already be an agreed protocol for how uh, we will handle the triage of patients. Um, and there are some good reasons for that. Now I'm going to mention just three of them. The first is it's important to have triage protocols in place in order to promote decision making that can be ethically justified. There's widespread consensus that a kind of first come first serve basis uh, is, or even a lottery basis for deciding who to treat um, is not the most ethically justified means um, of deciding. What we need is some kind of non-arbitrary, but rational, consistent and fair process. So in terms of bioethics principles, the principle of justice obviously does the heavy lifting for us in a situation such as this. And we have to be asking ourselves, what can we do in a situation which not everybody can be treated? How do we then decide who is gonna be treated? Principles of beneficence and non-maleficence also play an important role here because together they point to the fundamental principle that is generally applied in these contexts. And that is that since there are scarce resources, we need to use those scarce resources to achieve uh, the greatest benefit possible. 
The second reason that triage protocols are so important is because of the need to protect against possible legal challenges and liability. Now, courts are reasonable, so they will acknowledge extraordinary challenges and the extraordinary circumstances, uh, but that does not excuse us from having applied our minds in the first place. So one of the ways in which uh, professionals can be protected uh, from legal challenges in the future in a situation like that is to apply an agreed triage principle that's been agreed to upfront, because that means that a considered attempt has actually been made at trying to ensure fairness and consistency. One of the best ways to, to ensure that, that that kind of cover is available is by using or adapting protocols that already have wide endorsement by professional bodies. Um, and the reason that is so helpful is because the courts will very often use uh, the standard of what other reasonable professionals would do in the same situation. Um, and if one can say that the, the triage protocol that has been chosen uh, already had widespread acceptance, um, amongst the, the medical fraternity, um, it gives one that sort of level of, of protection. Um, as it turned out, the, the triage protocol suggested by the Critical Care Society um, was one that did receive fairly widespread support um, and was applied, um, to my knowledge, uh, in a number of, of, of situations, um, including uh, in, in, in the public and in the, in the private sectors um, during this period. And then finally, a third reason that we need triage protocols is to help to reduce practitioner stress um, and as well as what we call moral anxiety. Um, and one of the reasons it's helpful to have these protocols in place because there's a sense in which it seems less personal if decisions are being made according to an agreed protocol, um, it, 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 it takes away some of the pressure um, on the clinicians. Another important principle is that it helps uh, if attending clinicians can be relieved of the emotional burden of making these decisions on their own. Um, and if these decisions are made by a committee or by a group or a team together, um, it takes away some of the personal moral anxiety uh, that can come from making decisions which are life and death uh, decisions for certain patients. And finally, it is quite helpful also in helping to communicate decisions that have been made to the patient or to the family. So if there's transparency about the protocol that is being used, uh, it can be explained that the reason a particular patient has not been triaged, let's say for, for uh, intensive care, um, is because they don't fulfill the requirements uh, of the protocol. Now, one of the important things that came up quite early on was, well, how does one decide which, what is a good protocol and what is not? Um, and so one of the things that I had turned my attention to was to looking at values which should underlie uh, these, these triage protocols um, and using those almost as a kind of a checklist by which to measure uh, which protocols uh, would, be, uh, would be ethically justified and which wouldn't. And the first value that seemed to come out in the literature um, it was a very wide agreement um, that the first thing that is important to do in a situation such as this, where there are scarce resources, uh, is to make sure that we maximize the benefit that is obtained from those resources. Now, bear in mind, this is still contentious, but nonetheless, there is widespread agreement about it. And that usually gets unpacked into two things. First is the imperative to save as many lives as possible. Um, and then in addition to that, there's an imperative also to save as many life years as possible. Now, it doesn't take very long when you start thinking about that to realize that, that those two imperatives can lead to contradictory priorities. Um, so one has to come up with some way in which these uh, can be balanced against each other um, and, and there are different systems in place for it. Uh, for instance, there's an inherent system uh, in place uh, in the critical care societies. Uh, triage protocol. Another important value is the value of equanimity and respect for dignity. Um, and in South Africa, with the constitution that we have, uh, we should know uh, that all patients have to be treated as, as being equal in dignity um, and that we shouldn't be taking into account factors that are non-medical, uh, such as race and gender, social status, and all of the others that we know uh, fall under that list. Um, and then finally, if we're going to apply this principle, we also have to be very careful uh, that people don't try to use social status or political power um, as a way to try to influence these kinds of decisions 
uh, the kind of pressure uh, which can sometimes be placed on practitioners um, in these contexts. And finally, a third value uh, that needs to underlie these protocols is the value that support for patients uh, who are not offered critical care uh, needs to be provided as well. Um, so it's really important to bear in mind that where a decision is made that a patient is not going to get critical care, uh, that they are referred for appropriate medical or palliative care um, and management of their symptoms. Where appropriate, according to most bioethics principles, uh, patients should be referred to somewhere else if they can't be treated um, in a particular institution. Uh, but in this kind of context, uh, that becomes vanishingly unlikely. Um, and in situations like that, uh, we need to at least make sure that patients receive care. And finally, uh, there's fairly widespread agreement uh, that it is morally permissible uh, to prioritize healthcare workers for treatment in this kind of context. Um, and the reason for this um, is because frontline responders are obviously instrumentally important in our response to the pandemic itself. So it's not because they're more worthy than any other people, it's because they can help others, um, but also to protect uh, fellow frontline responders, families and patients um, as well. I'm just briefly um, looking back now uh, at, at events uh, that have happened since then. Um, some lessons learned uh, from a sort of post-surge perspective. Um, in general, I think it's interesting to see that there was what seemed to me at least to be a fairly broad uptake of triage protocols, uh, both in the private and in the public sectors. Um, but clearly we don't have much data available at the moment, so that's based just on personal experience. Um, it will be interesting to see eventually, um, you know, who actually went and, and decided on protocols and who didn't. One thing that's emerged very quickly, uh, particularly with uh, practitioners in the in the private sector, uh, was that there was a huge fear of consequences or of litigation uh, should decisions be made to withhold or withdraw treatment. Um, and one of the concerns about that is that if there is that fear, people will often then be be tempted uh, to not use the protocol, uh, but to rather simply give a patient treatment no matter what. Um, and that's a threat, obviously, to fairness and consistency um, of these protocols. Another thing that emerged was that very few practitioners seem to have any idea um, that the HPCSA, in fact, have guidelines on withholding and withdrawing treatment um, and guidelines on palliative care. Um, and if they had known the content of those guidelines beforehand, they would have been in a much better position uh, to, to know what to do. Um, and then finally, it was quite encouraging, I thought, uh, to see how frontline responders rose to the challenge, not only in making themselves available at risk to themselves and their families, uh, but also um, at creative solutions that seemed to be found. Uh, you know, I've heard wonderful stories about how, how nurses were making sure uh, that family members, for instance, could have WhatsApp chats with family members who couldn't visit, um, and, and how everyone sort of went out of their way to, to try to find creative solutions in the context. A few lessons regarding uh, the public and private sectors. Um, seems that the private sector is obviously far less experienced in dealing with resource limitations, um, and that became problematic. Uh, there's a sense in which those in the public sector have, have, have had more experience of dealing with this kind of thing. Also, interestingly, the public sector has this hierarchical management structure, um, and that seemed to facilitate centralized triage decision making. Uh, whereas in the private sector, as someone from the Western Cape said in, in one of the first retrospectives uh, that I was involved in, uh, it's a little bit like herding cats um, because everybody basically does their own thing. Each clinician uh, makes their own decisions. Um, and this pre presents a very serious structural barrier to fair and equitable and consistent applications of triage policies. Um, so I think it's something that needs consideration uh, in the future. Obviously, there are plenty of lessons around systemic inequities and injustice, and I'm going to focus only fairly narrowly again on those in the clinical context. Um, I think it was good to see that there was such a willingness to cooperate between the public and private sectors. Um, but in the end, it turns out that the public sector uh, did not use 
the private sector anything like as much as was initially anticipated. Um, in fact, I saw a report just this morning suggesting that only four patients in the Western Cape were ever uh, referred from the public sector to the private sector. Um, so all the preparation that, that went into making that possible um, didn't really lead to very much. And the question we need to ask ourselves is in a worse pandemic than this one, um, if facilities had become seriously overwhelmed, more overwhelmed than they were, uh, would this, this, this uh, cooperation still have worked? But what it certainly did still point out was that this vast gulf in resources between the two sectors um, remains really disturbing. Um, and maybe there was some improvement along the way, an improvement in communication, uh, but the systemic problem is still very, very serious. Um, did pick up that there's possibly a danger in the private sector of inappropriate futile treatment being given um, and of over-servicing, uh, partly because the, the facilities are available um, and partly because uh, I think there's a fear of litigation. Um, and then there might also in the public sector be an increased danger of burnout or compassion fatigue, uh, considering how much more um, overwhelmed uh, the public sector is likely to become in a worse pandemic than this one. In terms of other future preparedness, uh, we have yet to see fully what the effects have been on non-COVID patients um, and their outcomes, uh, people who have not gone to hospitals, people who have not taken their treatment, um, as well as the effects on vaccination programs and what the effects on health will be. Uh, the socioeconomic effects of lockdown and longer term health related to that uh, still has to be factored in. Um, and I think we need to be very aware of the fact that our work in the next while is to do reviews and critiques of policies um, and of practices uh, through this period uh, once more data is available for us to be in a position to be able to do so. Um, that's all uh, I have to say in this formal part of the presentation, um, and these are my references. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. I think um, it is quite important that in the midst of us having so many discussions on um, COVID-19 and a resource allocation to go back to, to the value systems that um, should drive decision-making in the, in the clinical setting. And I do think that it is important, as you mentioned, that as we go into the future, um, we reflect on um, perhaps benefits that we have earned in, in the previous um, few months um, and figure out ways to, to review current protocols to prepare better for um, what is perhaps anticipated to be a second wave. Um, with that, I would like to hand over the floor to um, Laurel. Okay. Thanks very much, Lazeka, and uh, thanks, Kevin, as well. Um, Kevin, could I ask you to share the slides? Great. Okay, good afternoon, colleagues and uh, friends and um, interested people. Thanks for coming. Um, I am um, going to um, speak uh, not so much to um, the paper that uh, that I wrote that was in the same issue as Kevin that really tried to anticipate um, the fault lines and deal with the confusion and uncertainty. Um, next slide. But I, I would rather want to put out first um, something about Two, two challenges in a way. I mean, the first is that uh, one is that could we in some way putting out a meta ethic um, that we could consider, and again, borrowing from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, could we perhaps consider uh, love in the time of COVID-19 um, specifically uh, in terms of the more general ethics in the time of the pandemic. And I, I thought that perhaps people could consider this, and I don't mean um, necessarily romantic love as uh, Marquez dealt with in his novella, um, but some of the other types of love, such as neighborly love, love thy neighbor as thyself, fealty, duty, 
agape, deriving from Judeo-Christian uh, traditions, uh, Ubuntu from our South African tradition, um, the professional love um, of the healer, which is our duty to respect, to protect, to care for others. Um, and then what are the limits of that for, uh, in terms of also self-protection and self-love. And of course, within this as well comes that shadow of love, the love of power, the love of money, um, which uh, I think could be seen as the flip side. So I put this slide up, not so much that I'm going to go into greater detail, but if people could sort of hold this as, uh, as I run through the presentation as a possibility, a consideration, what would love in the time of COVID-19 um, as a meta-ethical question um, have done for us and perhaps uh, landed us in a, in a slightly better place. Um, so I'm going to share some reflections informally and I've also put this up because I'm requesting some literary license um, like Marquez and these lessons are non-linear. So while this is not magical realism, it's, it's very real because I'm also speaking from the perspective of having been in the war room and the nerve center day in and day out since March um, for the province. Um, and at the same time, I've signed non-disclosure confidentiality agreements. So I think that we will have to sit with this somewhere between um, fact and fiction. And I'm, um, I'm going to really hopefully uh, abide by my, my, my signed uh, vows of, uh, of confidentiality. So let's move on, Kevin, please. Okay, so in 2020, we're doing a 2020 retrospective on COVID-19 um, and looking at the kind of ethical dilemmas or limitations of human rights that we anticipated. And, uh, and I think that there were two that people wrote about very early on, and this is again within the South African context, but also globally, um, that we had a pretty good sense of the conflicts, um, especially from a human rights perspective and even the ethical perspectives um, between individual entitlements and public health. Um, so the going into lockdown level five, um, which required enforcement and put forward an alcohol ban really limited people's individual freedoms um, in favor of that emergency that Kevin talked about, that crisis, that public health crisis, where we really weren't sure how this was going to play out in our own context. Um, and so the government invoked um, special legal powers, which enabled it to do things that under normal circumstances it would not be able to do. And they invoked something called the Syracuse principles, which were set out in 1984. Um, that actually looked at when is it appropriate to limit our human rights and freedoms. Um, and this is from the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And so these are a direct quote that um, as long as these limitations were carried out in accordance with the law, so that's tick, check, we had that because we have um, you know, laws that, that enabled the, the president to um, uh, to, um, to exercise those powers in extreme circumstances. The general interest, which was uh, non-transmission or reduced, decreased transmission of the virus. And these are strictly necessary in a democratic society, so we're not living under military or martial law. Um, these were the least intrusive and restricted to achieve the objective, tick, and it was supposedly based on um, scientific evidence, it was not arbitrary, and it was, uh, um, it was applied to everyone equally, not a certain uh, group. Um, and also that it would be reviewed finally um, um, uh, regularly and that the duration of this would be limited, which again, I think uh, 
um, the president and cabinet uh, kept and, and his consultation with business leaders and the scientific community um, enabled these, um, these restrictions to be uh, reviewed. And even there was a plan of different levels. So it, I think that there was an anticipation that we would arrive where we are right now at level one. Next slide. And then I'll, I'll spend less time um, on this because I think Kevin reviewed this nicely um, and not only his article, but articles by uh, Jerome Singh, Kia Menthri Moodley, Leslie London, um, looked at the question of resource constraints. And this was really on the um, ICU, critical care access, ventilators, and as you heard Kevin talk about, the ethics of scarcity, fairness, utilitarianism, um, looking at advanced directives. Um, and let's see, and I guess what's cut off from the slide there is that the Critical Care Society of South Africa actually updated their guidelines in March 2020 um, to, to deal with this. So what I want to do next is maybe look at the ethical um, dilemmas or lapses or challenges that we didn't necessarily anticipate. And um, these are going to be across three areas. Um, so issues that came up that, um, that we perhaps didn't anticipate or certainly um, caught us by uh, surprise or a little bit off guard maybe some blind spots as well. So I think in the area of preventing transmission, um, the shortages of testing, the lack of capacity um, from the NICD, the, the lengthy turnaround times, the loss of samples, uh, the limitation of testing, the fact that we only had uh, one type of PCR and that the accessibility through SAPFRA, um, that's the approval body. Um, and, and some of these issues are global, so they're not necessarily uh, South African specific, but uh, I think that that raised a lot of issues where we found in some cases, um, and, and again, this is all in the public domain, that uh, backlogs with testing, we had healthcare workers competing in some ways with patients or patients, some patients competing with other patients about access to timely and accurate testing. The line lists, which are the every uh, day, the, the numbers of people. Um, so as a collective um, and as a public, we got um, aggregate numbers. But on the other hand, the, the core principle of public health is to prevent transmission containment. Um, and so what that meant that uh, all of someone's personal data, their names, where they live, their telephone numbers, um, who they'd seen, so that is about tracking, tracing, so that people can go into isolation if they were positive and quarantine if they were um, a, a contact. So all of this raises the, the issue of um, techno security um, and monitoring people's movements um, because not everyone would give a, um, a, a, a real or accurate cell phone number. And so it meant it was a question about how far would you go or should we go um, to find a positive person, restrict their movement or at least monitor their movement um, engage their contacts and ensure that uh, that spread was um, was was actually viral spread was actually decreased. Um, non pharmaceutical measures. So, what should the police enforce compulsory mask wearing? Um, what about people staying inside when during lockdown? In fact, it was more dangerous to be inside a crowded area where people could not actually obey that, that, that law. Um, so that the, we, saw, um, we saw evidence of police brutality, et cetera. Um, 
again, in hotspots, so the identification of certain neighborhoods as hotspots, um, I think that in some ways serve to stigmatize um, particular groups of people and, and around group areas act and the legacies that we still have. Um, I think that enforced stigma, it also enforced stigma in a way um, of community health workers who were sent out door to door and there was a belief among um, people that perhaps um, COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV virus was actually being brought by healthcare workers into their neighborhoods. Um, and then did we do enough around particular vulnerable populations and the workers who work with vulnerable populations? And I'm thinking particularly of long-term care facilities, the elderly, um, those people with disabilities, schools, and, uh, and what that meant in terms of people losing their jobs and, uh, and also worker safety, um, as well as populations in closed institutions. Next uh, slide. In terms of providing care, um, I think in the interest of time, uh, I think Kevin has really gone over a lot of the issues between um, public versus private divide and alignment. And I think this gives us a glimpse into the work that's required to, uh, to get us to NHI and to a single healthcare system eventually. Um, this also played out in terms of drug availability, what formularies, um, was the private, you know, were private practitioners that herding cats or the kind of lone practitioner, lone ranger, um, were they using experimental treatments, uh, perhaps, or not at least non-proven therapies in particular ways off-label um, versus what could be considered best practice? I also think, and I'm sure this came up last week, um, that the whole pandemic response um, was incredibly hospice centric. Um, new infrastructure, alternative building technologies, the, the health technologies, the focus on ventilators, ICU uh, nurses um, was really at the expense of, of primary care or community-based care. Um, and in a way, routine health services, and we've written about this as well, the decline um, in people coming for immunizations, bringing children for immunizations, family planning, um, the increase that we've seen in backstreet abortions because TOP services were, um, you know, were restricted, the delayed diagnoses of cancers, uh, elective surgeries, et cetera. Um, and this, I think, had a backlash in a way to healthcare workers themselves. Um, and this, in a way, is where, um, and although there are also on the flip side of this, some incredible examples of how uh, healthcare workers went above and beyond the, the call of duty, um, they were also in continuous uh, fear. Um, and the kind of moral anxiety, distress, moral fatigue, and moral injury led to a lot of mental health issues um, and refusal to work because of inadequate um, personal protective equipment, and therefore, in, in their minds, um, justified clinic closure rather than having a kind of set uh, criteria and protocol for clinic closure. Next. And then lastly, in terms of ensuring a good death or, uh, you know, in terms of the response, um, also dealing with, um, with disposal or uh, appropriate, um, appropriate uh, in terms of the population, uh, a way for, from a public health perspective to, to handle people dying in numbers. Um, I think that generally there was an avoidance of the topic. It makes people feel very uncomfortable. Uh, doctors feel very uncomfortable. We don't like talking about, um, it's, I think it's getting better in terms of palliative care. It gives us a, a way to discuss it. But with the COVID-19 pandemic, it was, I think, a bit difficult to apply 
some palliative care to someone who becomes acutely ill. Um, and we don't really know how to, uh, to you know, there's no playbook for how to ensure when, when we hit that point of futility because the experience is not, is not there. Um, on the flip side of that, there's, and again, this is where I, you know, I think that the context where I write about in, in the article is that the status quo and the differential, um, the differential um, whose life matters more so that in some ways, um, you know, we have an acceptance of the status quo that certain people's lives are worth more than other people's lives versus this never say never and continuing to go um, even when there's a 95% chance of, uh, of, of the person never coming off the ventilator. Um, we also had challenges around what constitutes a COVID-19 death. And so while the WHO makes it very clear because of our inability to test, um, the death certificates, uh, and I think the MRC has shown that with the numbers of excess deaths um, in, in our province up to three times. Um, and so that families may not have closure and that might also have helped to drive stigma. Um, in terms of the right to strike, uh, should undertakers and funeral services be allowed to strike during a pandemic? And I think the impact um, around grieving and mourning our rites and rituals are, are really, um, yes, exactly. And I think someone has just made a comment and I, I agree completely with that. So there's no closure. And then the management of the deceased. Um, okay, next. Next slide. So is there a silver lining, um, you know, and I think that in a way, going back to the possibility of, of, a, of, a, meta, of a meta ethic, um, I think that these are not necessarily resolved yet, but I think they enable us to have potential and, um, and possibility and opportunity. So I think what this has done is that it's really thrown up the ethics of the mental health of healthcare workers in our settings. Um, it's allowed us to talk about a little bit, it's opened the space, I think, to discuss workplace bullying, um, the hierarchies within our workplaces. And I think we've seen this in networks. Um, there's a new film that's come out called Behind the Front Line. I wanna give a plug for that. Um, Dr. Young, Dr. Uh, a young Dr. Adil Khan um, and a lot of his colleagues have come out um, to, to bring this out into the open, which gives us a possibility, I think, of more advocacy and curriculum change and training for self-care. Self I think that it's been the whole discussions um, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and will the vaccines be distributed equitably? Um, and I think uh, from perspectives from the global south and key populations have come out in order for us to be able to access equitably um, the benefits of scientific achievements and, advance and advances. Next. And then I think that this has drawn because of vaccines and treatments it's brought heightened attention to research ethics. And I think in a way it's been able to democratize science a little bit. Um, and people are talking about, uh, you know, should we be on chloroquine? Should we not take chloroquine? Um, and I think uh, what's also been exciting from a strictly academic perspective is the retraction of journal articles and the accountability of um, the ethical accountability of um, large important journals to fact check and um, and and uh, and retract where necessary, and I think um, and these are my last two points is that we are now beginning because we've had no choice to really uh, pull back the veil on our social context. 
And so I think we have an opportunity to rebuild or create a new economic order, one that's founded on principles of equity, transparency, um, socioeconomic rights, and third generation human rights, um, which are which landed us uh, here to begin with, which is about environmental rights and uh, climate, global climate issues. Um, and then lastly, we're seeing in our own context, a little bit of accountability for corruption um, that it, it brings back um, perhaps the hope at least of some truth, of prevailing truth, justice, and, um, and non-impunity. Um, and I think that's the other thing is that people's true colors um, and the virtues and values that they hold um, have also become, uh, you, you can't hide uh, in a pandemic. So where the, the chips fall, um, there's a kind of forced uh, visibility, the veneer, the veneer it is, wears thin very quickly. So I think that's it. Um, I think that's my last slide. Good. Okay, so Lizeka, thank you and, and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, um, Laurel. I, I think as I was listening to your presentation, I realized that e even if we continuously have discussions around COVID-19, it seems that these unanticipated and perhaps even latent um, lapses and challenges in, in the system broadly um, are so extensive that we must continue to have discussions around um, resource allocation at a systems level, um, considering that there was a shift to a hospice centric outlook. Um, and I mean, even talking about protests in a time of COVID-19, um, death at a COVID-19 uh, COVID um, era, and, and just realizing that the, the issues are expansive and so challenging and each need to be addressed. Um, and I just want to read a, a comment here by Shirley, um, and, and Shirley says that one of the most difficult issues we have to deal um, with has been the grief issues. Patients, um, loved ones have um, really not been able to mourn properly, even where patients did not die of COVID-19. Um, and, and this has caused significant distress. And, and so you can see that there are a multitude of challenges um, that continue to, to affect um, this era of COVID-19. Okay, thank you so much to our speakers. Um, I really appreciate um, the inputs um, and I think um, the audience as well, based on, on the comments, really appreciated the insights. Um, I would like to kick off with um, a question. Uh, so the first question that I have is, is to Kevin. Um, and so this question really speaks to resource allocation. Um, there is uh, understanding that, you know, prioritizing the worst off, um, might be one way to consider uh, a, a triage protocol or to be considered in a triage protocol. So in, in an instance where a factor like age um, might influence the, the um, severity of um, someone's um, disease and, and experience in, in COVID-19, how do you balance um, severity um, such as age com comorbidities um, with uh, maximizing number of years, life years. So simply put, you know, what would a clinician um, be advised to do if they had an old patient versus a young patient um, in, in, in that particular case? Um, and secondly, uh, Leslie in the comment section um, posed quite a similar question around factors that influence um, this cl clinical decision making. And, and they say that there are some disabilities which affect things like um, response to um, expensive and limited therapies, but many disabilities do not work in this way. Um, from our work um, and from overseas data, we are concerned that informally disabled people may be triaged out for non-medical reasons. Um, what uh, have the discussions been on this? And, and the specific question is, what would you um, advise in, in terms of triaging for um, people with disabilities? And then for, for Laurel, I'll, I'll just pose both questions right now. Um, one question from, from Nicolette. Um, what is the danger of over-servicing in, in critical care? 
Um, and if I can just pop in a, a last one, uh, which says, how does triage um, protocols square with our constitutional right that no one may be refused a medical um, emergency care, um, no rights were suspended under the disaster regulation from um, an anonymous attendee. Kevin? Sorry, Kevin uh, or Laurel? Yeah. Yeah, I was just okay. trying to keep my mic unmuted. Um, yeah, okay. So in terms of the first question, uh, which seemed to largely be around age um, issues, um, let me speak of my experience uh, in terms of, of what it looked to me was happening on the ground. And that is that most people seem to use the critical care society's um, triage protocol or something quite strongly based on that. Um, and in that uh, approach, uh, basically age only came into the calculation uh, that would determine who was treated or not as a tiebreaker in situations in which there was a, a very close, um, you know, there were, there, were, there were patients who had in, in every other way the same sort of, of circumstances or prognosis. Um, and, and so, so age didn't really play much of a factor there. And I think the main reason for that was that it was already using um, other kinds of, of, of objective means of trying to, to distinguish between patients uh, because it started off with looking at a frailty score um, and then it looked at, at the SOFA score, sequential organ failure um, assessment. Um, and then after that, they, they, they had a look at uh, comorbidities. Um, and those factors together were, were taken as generally enough to, to work out which patients should be prioritized. Um, and age only came in if there was a tie at that, at that stage after that calculation had been made. Um, so, you know, on the ground, I don't think that, that, uh, that age actually on its own was used. Um, and the general thinking about this kind of thing is that very often we don't really need to, to, to consider age too much uh, because age will be, you know, there, there are other concerns that are, that are much greater in, about the actual health of the person. Um, what, what was done in the, in the C CSA's uh, protocol to try to ensure that both um, saving most lives as well as the principle of, of, of uh, saving life years uh, were considered uh, was that the um, comorbidities uh, scale was used as a basis for considering uh, you know, uh, longevity um, after, after treatment. Um, so that's where it was kind of brought in as part of the calculation. Um, the second question, if I remember correctly, was about people with disabilities, and I was not aware anywhere of any uh, protocols in which disabilities were mentioned specifically. So that was not taken, would not then have been taken into account directly. Uh, but obviously, if that disability, for instance, had an impact on the frailty scale, um, uh, that that could that could uh, have have come into into the discussion. Um, and it would be interesting actually uh, to, to have a look um, and discuss with, with people who represent the disabled community uh, exactly what, you know, what impact uh, disabilities could have on people's frailty score um, and whether that in, in, you know, constitutes any kind of unfair treatment. Um, it would be something I'd be interested in, in investigating. Thanks, Zeka. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Laurel? Okay. Um, so I think one of the questions was on the over-servicing. Um, is, that, is that right? So, so I think, you know, there, there are, um, in, in addition to decisions about treatment, um, there, there are decision um, tools that clinicians can use to predict outcome based on 
uh, a collective um, outcome score in a way that uh, that you can plug in certain factors. So age, gender, severity of, um, of disease. And, and I think that, you know, again, this is where I tried to put up um, this question of, are we doing enough to discuss with people um, advanced directives and their wishes about um, how they would like to be, the extent to which they would like their lives to be uh, saved and resuscitated. Because right now, um, I think that we don't necessarily have a, a culture. I think it's come up in a way with uh, socially where when we were talking about euthanasia a few years back and the right to die um, conversations. But you know, it didn't really come up with regards to COVID and the people who were at most risk of, of dying from, from COVID. Um, and I think the point that was made or that both by the someone in the audience and that I was making, and, and I think Kevin alluded to, it was a very lonely journey for people being in ICUs um, and not having that level of contact and comfort of family and loved ones and even healthcare workers providing um, providing that level of companionship um, during these, these times. So I think that several things, I mean, the danger of over-servicing is that by the time you, you probe and, um, you know, and, and, and do all of these heroic interventions and you have a 95% chance of not coming out of it and however long that takes for, for, for you to die, whether it's five days or seven days or 10 days, um, you know, you, you can actually be causing harm to the, you know, by going that route, you can be causing harm to the person who, the patient who is receiving that treatment. And also, I think it's very distressing for family members and also even for healthcare providers. Um, someone asked this question around moral injury. Um, and I think with having a kind of futile with, with prolonging life where there is perhaps no chance of um, of a positive outcome, I, I don't think that that is, uh, is, is, is very good, as hard as, as it is. And so the UK um, and NICE uh, made it very clear that by using this decision tool that they would decide um, you know, what to provide to, to which patients over, which, over what period of time. I also think, you know, that in a way by over-servicing at, at that end of the spectrum, and again, our emphasis and even our conversation today, which, which is around um, ventilators and uh, secession of, um, of, of acute treatment like that, we really didn't do enough um, because only 10% of everybody with COVID was actually hospitalized. And of that, an even smaller percent um, were, and, and it, when it was less, of course, in the public sector versus the private sector, were treated in general wards with oxygen. And so th there's also not only a kind of personal individual danger, but there's a collective danger that by putting so many resources into very high tech care that the low tech, low touch, um, you know, kind of uh, interventions um, such as home-based oxygen, or at least an oxygen concentrator, or what you guys heard about last week in terms of the use of Nazarek, um, that, that, that there was a lot of battle to, to shift the thinking um, that many people could be, have been treated with ho at home, but yet needed maybe uh, a visit from a GP or regular twice a day phone calls. So the resources did, did not go into that type of, um, uh, that, 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 those type of services. Um, and I think I just see Sarala as well, um, that, you know, in terms of resources being diverted to COVID at the expense of other treatable conditions, 
you know, I, I mentioned that in passing, but, you know, I hope we don't see a, a, a resurgence of measles or polio. Um, and I think we're, we're starting to see this with uh, cancers going undiagnosed and with the long list of, of surgeries um, that people still have yet to, to be scheduled. So whether it's for cancer surgery or a hip replacement, knee replacement, um, I think those are those are issues. Okay. My my only other thing is on the issue of disability because I think it really is important um, that and and again I think that uh, you know where there are long term care facilities uh, for people with uh, physical uh, mental. Uh, disabilities that we we needed to be a lit up uh, you know much more inclusive um, to really deal with those specific issues. Um, similarly, like we did with prisons, I, I actually think the prison story is a success story um, because there were uh, people uh, who felt this was a priority and recognized that vulnerability and took proactive uh, action. Thank you so much, Laurel. I, I think you've covered quite a number of questions that were in the Q&A and chat box. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. And so we cannot take um, any further questions at the moment. But I, I do want to um, stress that the conversation will be continuing um, through the series of, of webinars that is being hosted um, through the Pandemic Pangolin um, Systems, Science and Society um, series. And so um, please do tune in for more discussions um, so that we can expand on, on these discussions um, and questions that perhaps weren't answered today. With that, I would love to thank our speakers. I think um, they provided insights. They've also provided um, tools um, and resources that we can um, go to uh, as we move forward in, in the pandemic. And I, I really appreciate um, how they've um, handled and answered each of the questions that have been posed to, to the speakers. Um, with that said, I would like to thank everyone else, um, the um, people who attended and taking your time to, to have this discussion. Um, it was truly an edifying discussion. Um, and I would also like to thank the, the hosts, um, the School of Family Medicine. Um, we really appreciate this opportunity to have this discussion um, and through the series um, of webinars. Uh, just housekeeping, I, I do want to mention that next week's webinar um, will be hosted um, at 12 uh, p.m., so an hour earlier than the normal time. Um, so please do watch out for the time and, and the link to that. Um, and finally, there are um, is discussions with CPD in terms of organizing CPD um, for the webinars, both retrospectively and prospectively. So, um, please uh, look out for the emails um, and you'll hear more information uh, about that in, in the future. Um, thank you very much for, for your time um, and uh, we look forward to the next webinars. Thank you.